So, um, hi, and welcome to Live at Heart Southeast and our latest panel entitled Practice Makes Pitch Perfect, where we're going to look at the role of grassroots music venues in the development of talent in the creative economies. And I'm pleased to welcome today, sitting in with me, is um, Lassa Johansson. Um, Lassa is a lecturer in entrepreneurship at Linnaeus University. Um, but to relate it to the pitch perfect idea, Lassa is also an ex-professional footballer for Kalmar FF and was a member of the Al Svenskan winning team for Kalmar. So um, welcome Lassa, thanks for joining Thank us. Thank you very much, nice introduction. <laughs> so, that's it. I've, yeah, that, that Al Svenskan winning team. It's still, yeah, it's still got, it's got Smallland at the heart of it. So uh, you can say the Swedish Premier League it sounds better. Huh? Yeah, that's true. Actually, <laughs> we'll call it that. We'll call it the Swedish Premier League. Yeah. So, um, so just to yeah, like talk a little bit around this practice makes pitch perfect, Lasse, because I think yeah, when we spoke previously, yeah, we spoke about this analogy about the availability of pitches, whether that be football pitches or whether it be venues for hockey or for paddle, and can compare that with the availability of stages in grassroots venues. Um, so as part of a wider conversation around talent attraction, talent retention, and talent development as part of economic regional development policy. And that, of course, was like prior yeah, to the acceleration of trends that we've witnessed during the pandemic recently. <clears throat> and it seems to relate directly to the desire to see more grassroots venues and stages to be supported. And like the conversations with Svensk Live and now with the, yeah, the formation of Smallland Live as part of Svensk Live as well. And looking at the role of grassroots venues and small independent music venues as the training pitches of the next generation of the creative industries in the same way that our football pitches are where yeah kids learn to yeah kick a ball and play on the yeah on pitches as well yeah um, yeah i mean i don't think it's i don't think it's really solitary to just like uh, sports or music but no matter what you're up what, no matter what you're interested in, if it's entrepreneurship or if it's uh, a creative industry or, or if it's uh, the green industry, the green tech or whatever it is, you need places to start, right? You need, like you say, pitches to train at. You need uh, venues to play at. And also, if you're going to start a business or whatever, you need uh, knowledge about that, support from the society, places to try out, try again and all that stuff. So that goes pretty much for everything that you want to succeed in or you want to try out, you need places to be. That's it, the, you know, the, like I said, the ability to practice. And that's, that's the thing, you know, like Linnaeus University has such a reputable music and event management course. Yeah, and essentially it attracts the future generations of the music industry. Yeah, like we always say, it's like, yeah, when we go into meetings with the Swedish music industry, you can pretty much guarantee almost half of them have been to the Linnaeus program. But it, it seemed that we were then seeing the subsequent relocation of that hotbed of talent that had been attracted into the region, then having to yeah, exit to Stockholm, to Gothenburg or to Malmo in order to put the theory that they were taught into a practical application. And despite kind of like the numerous internal experiential experiences that kind of Linnaeus and the music and event management team put together, such as Rookie Festival and in Hultsrud as well. That was the analogy that I think we made. It was as if you had the best football academy in Sweden, in the region, but on a theoretical basis. And if those footballers wanted to kick a ball on grass, then they felt they had to go to Stockholm, to Gothenburg right. or to Malmö. Yeah. And I guess that seems to have been even more so since we lost Huntsford Festival in the region right. as well. Yeah, but I think that the what Sweden is good at and has been good at is that you offer great deals, great pitches to, to train on, great 
uh, support to young people who want to try out the music. Like you had the, you have music mandatory in school. Uh, you play the the fiddle, you know, the the block flight, and then you try out music instruments. You have the Kulturskola, who's uh, oh, pretty much every municipality can uh, offer the kids. You have the Studio Verbund where everybody's trying out for a very, very cheap, low cost. You can try out. We have a lot of uh, places where young people can try all these instruments in pretty much all of the municipalities that, are, that we have. No matter how big the, the, the municipality is, we offer a great deal of practice to young people, right? And then they come up to, to this, like what you said, we have a great offering in study and theory. But the thing is when you reach a certain level, I guess that's where the problem that you, uh, you're talking about exists. Because we have, I mean, I don't see, like I said, we have a great support in cultural events and support to young kids who want to tr learn how to play music and all that stuff. But when you come up to like at the professional level, uh, the support from the from the official from the officials from the state and government is it stops, and then I believe that it's I mean you need to have a certain amount of people right you have the critical mass to produce stuff and to to earn money on it so and to make a living right, and if you look at for example sports, it's I mean, we have like in in Sweden, we have like two hundred fifty thousand people registered as a football player, right? But it's only like three or four hundred of them who actually makes money out of it. Mm. But the other two hundred fifty thousand is still playing, but they're doing something else on the side. Yeah. And you have all that, you know the the you feel good. You can I mean you can enjoy football even if you're not a professional. But it's hard for a, uh, so what I'm saying is that, and then you can have clubs everywhere, right? Because there are so many people who wants to play f football and so many people are interested. So you get support and you get sponsorships for clubs in the smaller regions and smaller cities like Kalmar, for example. And then you can stay there and actually you have, and also to be a good in anything you need uh, role models right you need someone to look up to yeah. and that's what you have in every city because because you can have role models in that are staying there uh, so i think that's one of the reasons that people are moving to stockholm your boy and mom because you you need the critical mass you need the money i mean i, I just read a report that to make an album there's like 100 people involved like supporting and doing stuff or whatever. I don't know everything they do, but they, it's like 100 people to do an album in music. And you don't have 100 people in Kalma who knows all this stuff, right? So you need all that critical mass. And I guess that's why you need to move to a place where it's a lot of people with the same interest, with the same knowledge and who can come together. Yeah, I guess, I guess it's interesting because like, yeah, that critical mass if it was encouraged to be retained within a region, I guess the very nature of the way that the music industry has changed now as well is where you can create locally for a global market. So an mm -hmm. artist can be, yeah, based in Ostersham and based in Hultsford, based in Vestavik, based in Kalma, yeah, and reaching its global audience as well. <clears throat> and I think that's kind of like, yeah, an interesting point to touch on, like you say, about the number of people around, yeah, the project that is the music creation. And I think that's it. You know, small venues play a key role as hubs. Yeah, mm -hmm. for the coming those the coming together of those like-minded people as well. And I think you can kind of look at the role of those venues to actually drive a scene. Yeah. And that scene almost becomes that kind of like the workplace, the central hub that attracts those like-minded people. Yeah, to a region so they can peer network, yeah, peer learning from their network and things like that as yeah. well. Yeah, because I do believe that even if you can sit home and uh, produce and mix stuff and come up with uh, all this stuff, you need to actually meet people. 
And the best way to do so is to create arenas or peers that you say is to, to connect with other people. Um, it's not only in music industry. I mean, it's it's uh, it's in all industries that you uh, industries help each other. Like that's why you have these clusters mm -hmm. of creative uh, places where mm -hmm. people come together. And you also need some kind of flow, right? People coming in, make the mark, and then leave. Because if you have the same people on the same spot all the time, the creative the creativity is going to decline, right? So you need some kind of flow. Uh, also people coming in and out. So uh, that's what you need to create. And the thing you can do, I guess, is to uh, support the local places and acts where you can have these kinds of scenes or uh, peers. But, but it's also coming down to the, the, at the end of the day, it's, I mean, what a, what a municipality or a local government is, they need to, you know, they have this this amount of money, right? You don't have too much money. You have this money bag yeah. uh, with taxes and everything, and you need to, you know, prioritize what you what you're going to focus on, what you're going to spend your money at, and it also comes back to what you get for the money. So if you know that there are, like, in Kalmar, for example, the 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 young kids who are playing football is, I mean. All the kids are playing football, right? And then it's like nothing, nothing, nothing. And then you have floorball, for example, and you have riding horses and stuff. So it's not a coincidence that most of the money is going to football pitches, right? Because mm. there's most of the kids are playing football. Um, then it goes to uh, gymnasium halls or whatever. So it's important for the industry as well to show how it will diversify okay if you give us this money and we create this this meeting point or this scene uh and you see okay but this, you're only like 25 people coming and playing and we can't give you that much money because we have more money to give to all these people who are, who are doing other stuff yeah but if we do this we're gonna diversify it and it's gonna reach a lot of people so it's all come down to that, that the critical mass, again, how many people is gonna be enjoying this money that we are investing. And that's for a, that's for a local government to think about. And I guess, uh, I, I guess you know more about that, but it's, it's the same thing with the market, right? If they are gonna invest in a venue or in a person or something, it's much easier to do so in Stockholm and Mount Gothenburg because there are a lot of people coming and there's a lot of people you can choose from. Yeah, and I guess that's that's the role of like the small, you know, the small venues. It is wow. <laughs> it is like the yeah, the pyramid, yeah, the pyramid yeah. element of it, yeah, that's going up as well. And the, the the role that you know the small venues can play in that talent development area as well. I got you know analogize it to kind of like yeah, like you said about the study for Bunda and the music development. Yeah, you know, roles that there are in Sweden are, are second to none. Isn't that absolutely phenomenal? It's like, yeah, Daniel Janssen in his, yeah, you know, Swedish music miracle paper. Like, yeah, it's absolutely incredible the facilities that are available. But then the lack of venues, the lack of pitches for them to play on, yeah, is like the equivalent of you as a professional footballer training all week and then not having a game at the weekend. And yeah. that, that frustration it of is. being able to do that. And I think as well, yeah, like especially with, yeah, with our region as well, it's about seeing so much talent coming into the region and wondering whether there is, yeah, something that we can do. And I think that's what Small and Live are looking at as well. Yeah. The kind of like, yeah. And I've, yeah, and I think that it's a, <clears throat> it's also a, a matter of, I believe, I, I totally agree. We need to have more like events, more places to like arenas to, to, to uh, have music events on festivals and all that stuff. And we are, I think all the, at least semi big municipalities and places are, are, are focusing on that as well. I mean, all the cities with uh, have a Stadsfest, you know, and it is yeah. inviting people and they're trying to have a local touch, right? To see that there are local acts that actually can play on these venues as well. Um, I'm pretty sure that everybody's uh, is aware of that. They want to help. 
Um, but I guess it, you need also to kickstart the low, the the grassroots. I mean, you you could do as a municipality or a local government or a company for that, or the market for that matter, can actually do stuff from above, right? Okay, we are sponsoring this event, mm. come and play. But if you don't uh, get the grassroots to actually work in between, so you have to inspire the people that are actually in the music industry to, to work with the government or with the municipality, with the venues. So you have like a, because I mean, the whole football industry in Sweden, or the whole, the, all the sports are based on uh, voluntary work, right? Mm. It's the grassroots movements. You are, you do it for free. It's it's the movement, right? And that's why it why it attracts so many people, I guess. So you need to, I guess that's a way also to do it. You know, all that work. It's hard work in between, but it has to be done. That's it. And then again, you're talking about that pyramid where people yeah. are learning their trade yeah, yeah. In, in volunteering, essentially, in the way that like a band can go into a studio for Bunda rehearsal studio and hone its craft. Mm -hmm. And then the degree of professionalism gets brought on board yeah. as a band progresses. And, and if you can support that and, you know, make that bigger and better, I think the, the pyramid is going, they might stay a little bit longer. That's it. And we, we talk about the business of culture as well, because it's often very, yeah, music can get put into the culture side of it, whereas the business of culture and all those associated uh, jobs. And one, one big difference, Mark, if we're going to do the football analogies, <clears throat> is that everybody can teach soccer to kids, right? Mm. I mean, if you look at my kids now, they when they started, okay, I have been, but, but the, it's parents, okay? So you have a couple of kids in the, like seven years old. You have 10 kids and you are pretty much ask, okay, what parents have the time to do training twice a week, mm. right? Uh, someone raises an hand and they can start learning football. It's pretty much just throw out free balls and let them kick around. But you can't do the same thing with, you know, teaching. If you said that to me, I'm going to teach my kid to play guitar. It's going to, it's going to laugh in my face. So it's a lot, it's a lot of easier to get the sports practice going on with more people, right? Because no one can say that they can't do it in the, in the early stages. But it's when it gets out to professionalism and you get 14, 15 years old, you need a qualified trainer, of course. But I mean, that's 10 years of education. If you have 10 years of education in guitar playing, you need a, you need a proper guitar player, guitar trainer or teacher at, from the start, right? And I guess that is it because with the study for abundant system that you have got yeah. in place, that is available to everybody there as well. So yeah. I guess we are talking about like the action that you need to take then to enter the professional arena yeah. so, that, so that you can actually be sustainable realistically as an artist. And I think we come down to the critical mass, right? Don't you think so? You need, you need, the, you need the resources, you need the, the places and you need the people all that stuff to actually have a critical mass to 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 get it started. So it is kind of like, yeah, we we are looking at the the wider support for the small and the micro businesses, yeah, especially yeah. within the KKN, yeah. yeah, industries as well, because yeah, as Daniel put in his research yeah. on the Swedish Music Miracle, it is micro businesses that are going to underpin the music industry and the accelerated trend of shifting away from the capital cities which will probably follow mm -hmm. from the pandemic yeah increasingly as well seems like a perfect opportunity yeah to retain that talent in the region that we're drawing as well so it'd be really interesting to explore yeah i don't know how much i mean <clears throat> we have how are these people the creative people, I mean, it's always easier to support organized people, mm. right? So, for example, if you have the tech, like here in Kalma, we have uh, the, the tech companies. They have organized themselves in an organization and they can talk with one, one person can stand up for all of them. And then it's going to be easier to, you know, approach 
local governments and say we need this, we need to support that, better, better uh, infrastructure, whatever it is. And it, it could be the same thing with the, and it's it's been the same journey with the green industries, right? Yeah. Uh, they have now been organizing more, and they put together, and they, they have reached. Uh, uh, get more money from the EU, from the local government, because they are talking with one voice. Yeah. And that's also a way to you know organize themselves in the local area to say that okay, we in the creative industry, we need this. And but my my experience when I, uh, I mean, it's a little bit much too individual. So it's it's uh, maybe that's a way to get better to be a, talk with one voice. I guess that is a perfect link as well to like Maria from Small and Live as well, because that that recognition of the fact that yeah, collectively, yeah, we are stronger and the recognition that each of those venues can provide that local hub mm-hmm. for yeah, the creative industries. And then by building that network of those hubs then collectively small land will have a stronger voice as well to them. I think that's, I mean, that's a a simple uh, analogy is that if the football, I mean, we have in Kalmar, we have like 10 or 15, I don't know, Kalmar is about like 15 or 20 different football clubs of football. Yeah. And they come together and say, okay, we have a lack of pitches to play on. That's a lot of people saying that. And it's hard to resist that. Yeah. So the, it's again the critical mass. How many people are you? How much can you provide with? Then you get your voice heard. Wicked. Well, so it is. It's it's about organization and yeah, you know, collective bargaining yeah. you know, of, of the the creative industries associated with the music industries. Yeah, to kind of say you know we want to stay here. That's the thing. I think that's a key part of it as well. It's a very attractive region. <laughs> yeah. yeah. To, yeah. to live and to yeah to develop your creative business in isn't it and, yeah. and there are a lot of I mean there are a lot of creativity going on all over the places and in, in in this area massively it's like you say but it's it's small places all over the place so it's not really synchronized I think so it is this the, the co- the collective you know, union of the live venues which can then kind of like push that argument locally as well to to look at how we can you know develop the creative industries further so oh, yeah so the pyramid yeah again yeah rise rising up so that you, yeah. you, know, you where you start off so you start off and yeah at the bottom of the pyramid and you rise and, to the peak and the 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 thing is that our local is just an example about the pyramid we have our own event pyramid in in Kalma. and in the bottom we say that we're going to support local act and we're going to help local acts to do it themselves to grow. I mean, that's the base of everything to help local acts. Wicked. Thank you very much for your time, sir. I've just realized <laughs> that we are, we are running out, running out of time. And uh, you, you know, I know that I both, it both you and me can go on talking forever, right? <laughs> You know it. <laughs> and I so look forward to be back in the region as soon as is humanly yeah. possible so we can continue these conversations. Indeed. Uh, yeah, we missed the, the the live meeting indeed. So exactly. you're more than welcome. More than oh, welcome. I, I cannot wait. The first opportunity that I can be back in the region, trust me, I will be. So Lassie Johansson, thanks so much for your input. Thanks for yeah, Thank you joining much. us today. Um, yeah, and I will... See you very soon, hopefully. Hopefully, yeah. Cheers, Lassa. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So, welcome back to Live at Heart Southeast and to our panel, Practice Makes Pitch Perfect, where we're looking at the role of grassroots music venues in the development of talent in creative economies. And I have with me now Bev Wittrick, Strategic Director of the Music Venues Trust in the UK, and Maria Stadal from Small and Live. So um, hi both, and thank you for joining us here today. We really appreciate the fact of you giving it your time for us. So um, could I start actually by just asking you to give us a brief overview of the organisations that you represent, please? Who's going first? You go, Bev. You go, Bev. <laughs> 
Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so Music Venue Trust is a UK-based charity created in 2014 to protect, secure and improve the grassroots music venues across the UK. So we work in England, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland. Um, the charity was created to bring a collective voice for small independent venues and the vital work that they do developing talent and to very much lobby on their behalf for recognition of them as being vital for the music industry as research and development hubs and for their cultural, social and economic importance to their local communities. Thank you. And Maria? Uh, Small and Live just recently started uh, in November last year. And uh, we are in the region Småland in Sweden. And we have uh, uh, been granted money now to make a survey because we want to know where, where are all the music venues in Småland. And we want to bring them together and help them, just like, just like you, Bev, because you're seven years ahead of me. <laughs> um, and um, we also, uh, we're, we're part of Svensk Live, uh, who work for, uh, um, oh, I lost the word. Uh, we're part of Svensk Live, who work for, men vad heter, förlåt Emily, vad heter det? Mm. Live music. I'm sorry. Can we start over? <laughs> Can yeah. you cut and then? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I no. just got. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. Uh, <clears throat> we're a part of Svensk Live that work for uh, the live music in Sweden. Uh, and we hope to build a strong organization here in Småland. Excellent. Thank you. I uh, just wanted, you know, so everybody knew kind of what the, the two organisations were. And um, I spoke earlier to Lasse Johansson, um, ex-Kalmar FF professional footballer and also lecturer in entrepreneurship at Linnaeus University in Smallland. And we talked about the analogy between the availability of pitches, be they for football or venues for hockey or paddle, and the availability of stages in grassroots music venues, as it seemed to relate directly to the need to see more grassroots venues and stages to be supported, as they are really the training pitches of the next generation of the creative industries. And um, Sweden has outstanding resources in music development, such as the provision of studio and rehearsal resources by the Studieförbundet. And this allows the development of artists and producers, but so often those artists are then hamstrung by the lack of available stages for them on which to take the next steps in their career development. So there's no place for them to try out the new skills they've been honing all week without these pitches to play on. So um, how can we create those opportunities for artists and the conditions for venues to prosper, both generally and to you, Maria, like more specifically in Kalmelan. Uh, like I said before, the purpose of Smallland Live is to find out where are all the venues here in Smallland. And uh, we started off uh, this January with getting money from Region Jönköping, that is the local government in Jönköpings land. Småland is divided into three regions, which one is Kalmar, and we have Kronoberg, and we also have Jönköping. So Jönköping supported us with money so that we can find out all the music venues in Jönköping. And then uh, we are also in contact with Kalmar region and Kronoberg region to do the same there. Um, and when we have uh, a list of all these venues, we can contact them and tell them to uh, collaborate with us in Small and Live. We can also uh, support them financially if they want to make a concert or uh, they can uh, uh, have a grant from us. 
Um, I also think that we could be a link uh, to show the artists that here are the stages you can you can play on. So you, a link between uh, the event, uh, the organize, the organizer, and the artists. I hope so. Uh, but we have just started off. But you have to start somewhere. Absolutely, and on that front as well, we know from personal experience with Talent Coach in Kalmaran we're constantly having to go out and search for where new stages might appear. And I think post pandemic, given the attraction of Kalmalan, yeah, for holidays, those areas within Kalmalan yeah. and especially on Erland, there could be a lot of new stages that appear in that time. So having to have those registered so that we know how to be able to bring those opportunities together for the artists and the promoters as well. And Bev, on a more general yeah, note, what, what do you think, though, yeah, how we can create those opportunities for artists and the conditions for the venues to prosper? Well, I was just going to say, that sounds like an amazing project. And I kind of wish we'd had the ability to do that because it sounds really, really positive in the way that it is about making the most of those connections. I think the, the sort of slightly strange thing for us is... is we didn't go about it that way. We, we went about it in a way of desperately fighting to protect the venues that exist quite organically in the UK because the UK's always had a fortunate history of a lot of music just happening through, I guess, sort of um, belligerence and stubbornness, which is, is you know, a thing of, of People in the UK like there will be music and so they just start a venue and then people come and play in it and it all happened very very organically and what's really interesting is that because of that there are a lot of people that think that will always be the case and in fact what we've seen over the last 20 years is a massive decrease in venues because it's so difficult to make a grassroots venue that is tiny and is all about offering opportunities for artists to develop talent and they might be artists that really don't have audiences yet and so people are not going to buy a lot of tickets to come see them it isn't a model that makes money and so the challenge that we've had in the UK is these venues have existed but were gradually disappearing and what we had to do is kind of protect them and ring fence them by explaining that really important role that you kind of already know in Sweden you know you've already got all this music development stuff and you know that the artists have to meet with the audiences we've had to explain why that's important in the UK because I think a lot of people just sort of assumed it happens and they forget the artists need to get in front of an audience in order to learn how to interact with an audience. And as much time as you spend in a rehearsal space or in a recording studio, that does not make you a live artist. So I think it's been really, really interesting to try and, and explain and evidence that. And I mean, we've been really lucky in that we do have quite a lot of artist patrons who now talk about how vital venues have been to their career development. And they will talk very passionately about teeny tiny venues, some strange part of the UK where <laughs> they played their first few gigs. And that's actually really help, really helpful in explaining to other people not in the cultural industries who haven't thought about it why the venues are needed and why they are the interface for development of the artists reaching the audiences and, and building the careers. Absolutely. And yeah. with, with Lassa, we also spoke of the fact that the music and event management program at Linnaeus University attracts the future generations of the music industry. But it seemed that we were then seeing the subsequent loss of that creative talent to Stockholm, to Gothenburg and to Malmö in order for the students to put the theory that they were taught into practical application. And despite the numerous internal programmes provided by Linnaeus and within the course, such as Rookie Festival, and it, which was in Hultsford, it was as if the region had the best football academy in Sweden on a theoretical basis, but if the students wanted to kick a ball on grass and nurture their skills 
They were forced to relocate due to the lack of venues in the region for them in which to create their own events and to essentially learn the practical skills of event management. So a relative lack of venues in a region means there's fewer opportunities for the development of the associated ecosystem around the venues, doesn't it? Like promoters, agents, managers, lighting engineers. Yeah, there's no development of a local music industry infrastructure, and that then impacts on the creators, the writers, the producers, the artists. And without the support for grassroots venues, these associated skills within the music and creative industries are increasingly lost as well, aren't they? Both from the region, but also from the industry generally, as this pandemic has proven. I think it's, it's such an important part, point, Mark, and it's one that we, we talk about a lot because obviously in the UK, a lot of the music industry is very focused on London, but so much of it is focused on London or Manchester, Glasgow, you know, a few key cities that you then get so much activity focused on those places. But we keep trying to explain to people that the end result of that is that only people that grow up in a major city will have the experience of, of seeing small scale cultural activity and only they get to dream of being a musician or being somebody who works in culture. And this is why it's so important to sustain the venues in the small towns, in the villages, in the smaller cities, because in a big city, if you lose one venue, that's sad, but there are others. In smaller towns, if you lose one venue, you've lost the venue. And every music lover, every person who aspires to be involved in music has lost that opportunity to engage locally. And they get in their mind that they can only do that if they're prepared to travel or move. And that can't possibly be culturally healthy. It's got to be a case of, you know, opportunities for talent development, for creative development all over a country so that everybody gets to aspire or connect. Probably even more so now, you know, with the acceleration of trends post pandemic and where you can create locally for a global market. Yeah, probably, yeah, more so than ever now we're recognising that capability. And with, with that in mind, what role do you think um, government at all levels, yeah, local, regional, national, can play in the support and development of the venues, um, the infrastructure around grassroots venues, and the associated training to ensure talent attraction and talent retention in the regions outside of those traditional music capitals of which you just spoke, Bev. And especially given the new research that Live, the live music body in the UK, released recently about the passion and excitement that still exists around the potential for live music. So what do we, what do we think the role of government of all levels should be to help support the live venues? Shall I go first? Because I know Maria's going to have things to say as well. <laughs> for, um, for us, I mean, we deal with, with all the different layers of government. And for us, there's a huge amount still to be done out in the regions with the local authorities, with the more locally faced um, layers of government to improve the understanding of the importance of these venues, to see them as cultural hubs, to see them as generators of local economic activity, but also to see them as socially important. So support can come in many forms. Obviously, it's lovely if government's got money to give, but it's not always about the money. Sometimes it's about um, the sort of the way they deal with the venues in a very practical basis. So certainly in the UK, it's the local authorities who will give them their licenses, who will deal with anything to do with environmental health, to do with the way that they operate, the hours they can be open, the age of their audiences, all of these things. So there's an awful lot that happens at a local level. And for us also, it's very, very important that all levels of government treat grassroots music venues in an equal way they would a theatre 
or an art center or a gallery. And so that they're saying, yes, we see that this is a cultural venue because the thing that annoys me more than anything in the job I do is when people say, well, it's a bar that also has music. To which my response is, well, certainly in the UK, I've never been in a theater that doesn't also have a bar, but nobody <laughs> says, oh, it's a bar that does plays. <laughs> Very yeah. true indeed. Uh, Maria, what's, what's your uh, take on it with a, a more Swedish perspective between the le levels of government? Uh, well, I have written down almost the same points as you, Bev. So I, I suppose there's very many similarities between Sweden and 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 Europe. Um, my main experience is uh, as an organizer for a, a small music festival, a grassroots venue in Eksjö in Småland, and without the support from the local government, we we wouldn't make it. And it's not about the money, just like you said, Bev. It's not about the financial support many times, but they can make it so much easier for us because there are lots of meetings. You have to have permits, and uh, but if if you on a local level can gather everyone around the same table and just solve practical issues together. We have a meeting with the police, with politicians, officials, everyone sits at one table and you solve everything. And that makes it so easy because uh, a small venue is hard work and often people do it out of passion for music. And like you said before, uh, so many artists, they all started there. And it's so important that they remember that when they're in Globen in Sweden, in, in Stockholm and play that, oh, one time I played in Eksjö in Småland on a really small, small stage in front of 50 people. Um, so if you have the support from the local government, then the, the small venues can grow. Um, and also on a regional level, like where I'm now in Småland Live, I really uh, hope we get the support from, from Kronoberg and uh, Region Kalmar as well. So we can, uh, so we can have, a, a, yeah, so we can do everything we want with this, this new project. Um, of course, we need financial support to get started. But once you get the ball roll, rolling, um, then, then, yeah, it's easier. Uh, and then my last point is that on a national level, uh, like the situation we have in Sweden right now, where everybody is waiting uh, if we can do any events this summer, and we have a, a date in May that we wait for, if we can have an audience of 500 people or not. Um, that's, uh, it's about survival for many venues this summer. Uh, for the small venues, it doesn't matter for the, the big ones. They can't do anything anyway. But for the small venues that we talk about today, uh, maybe they can survive this summer if they can do for a crowd of 500 people. That's enough for them. So, um, yeah, the government support is, is really important. And presumably that's a role that Svensk Live are playing in yeah. <laughs> ensuring that 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 knowledge is passed through all tiers of government to ensure that, yeah, that support. Yeah, Svensk Live is working toward the Swedish government and, uh, and uh, yeah, they're doing a great job this year. It's been, it's been a hard year for everyone, uh, but they have uh, played an important role and been in a lot of discussions with the government. So I hope they can see live music's importance not just like you said Bev not only theatres and opera and everything but yeah the small venues that the that people want to see and long for. Absolutely and um, related to that as well there was a, a really good piece of research written by Daniel Johansson um, recently um, the Swedish music miracle yeah regarding the findings that he had that was it's increasingly micro businesses that will underpin the music and the creative industries. <clears throat> and the recognition that venues provide a hub and a space for emerging creatives to network, engage in peer learning and development. And essentially, as you said earlier, Bev, 
they can be the research and development departments of the music and creative industries. So um, is there a need for a collective voice to ensure specific support for those companies engaged in the business of culture on a regional, national and international level to ensure that the role of music venues in this business of culture is acknowledged and that their economic impacts recognized and to what extent does this network already exist that can be tapped into yeah with on a regional national and international level yeah to find these collective this collective voice i i would say that an an acknowledgement that this is needed has really grown over the last few years and there are lots of exciting developments but it's at different stages in different places so um, music venue trust is seven years old and we've seen a real change in the perception of grassroots music venues in that seven years we've built a network of over 900 venues that are now part of our music venues alliance so we can provide proper data to governments or to other people about the situation these venues find themselves in, which was, was vital during the COVID crisis. But we're also part of Live DMA, which is a, a European network of similar representative bodies, a lot of whom represent live music more generally, like Sven Slive, that is also a member. Um, and across Europe, these, these organizations are at very different stages. So for example, the Portuguese body was only, only formed during COVID. So that's a new member, I think they're called Sucrito. And you know, it's a growing movement in Europe. And equally, there's um, a kind of music venue trust equivalent in the US, Neva, that was formed about a year ago. But there are lots of links between research bodies or representative groups in North America, so Canada and the US. Um, we're actually working at the moment on our first international uh, venues day, which is uh -huh. going to be the first gathering of small venue or independent venue representative organizations. We're going, it's an online event, obviously, because uh -huh. we're planning it now. But there's a lot of real enthusiasm for pooling the knowledge and the good practice that these organizations at different stages are doing because the, the thing we all keep coming back to is how vital these small venues are to the ecosystem of live music Absolutely. and of the industry generally. And they are important for creativity, but also obviously the, the economics of it. You know, I mean, I think in the UK, the music industry is a 5.8 billion pound industry. You know, it's, it's, it's a big contributor, <laughs> but interestingly, in a lot of the conversations about the economy, the creative industries don't figure in that. So there's kind of a bit of a mismatch between the role that music and culture have and the way it's talked about economically that still needs to be tackled, I think. And Maria, what, you know, like you, you, obviously the very nature that Small and Live is in existence is recognition of that collective voice as well. Yeah. And um, as you said, we have uh, Sven Clive that works on a national level and has done so for uh, many years. And I think this year we have really proven how important it is that it has it that it exists. Um, uh, what we haven't spoken about is that it's not only small and live. We have Halland Live and we have uh, Skåne Live. So there are many different uh, regions in Sweden that the, these are popping up because they are needed. And um, this uh, fall, when we discussed whether we should start Small and Live now during a pandemic or not, uh, we said that we, we have to because they will need us more than ever now after this. And um, well, as an organizer for a music festival, we often have to uh, prove why we are needed and why it's important that we do this every year and um, 
like you said, about the economic impact and you make a survey and you show that it's good for the restaurants, it's good for the hotels, it's good for business, for the shops, for everyone. And we all, all um, often speak about putting our hometown on the map of Sweden so that everyone knows about it. And that comes out of live music. Um, so it's also good for marketing. Uh, so, yeah, um, it's, um, well, now I lost my key. <laughs> but I think you've just actually said something really important, which is that to, for the work we do, the venues are already doing really valuable work, but they yes. don't know how to evidence it or talk about mm -hmm. it in the way that demonstrates that to the policymakers, to the people who have the power to perhaps offer better um, conditions or funding. And that's where a, an organization, that a representative or an umbrella organization really is valuable because our job is to say, that thing you already do, you just need to talk about it in a slightly different way. And you need to gather some figures together about your audiences or about your turnover. Or, and then we can use that to evidence that you're already doing something important because most people who run a music venue, as you said, they do it for because they're passionate. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. They don't do it because they want to make money because you no. can't make money running a small venue. No. And they don't do it because they want to fill in application forms or write to governments. They do it because it's about the music. Yeah. They need people like us to then frame it and explain why that thing they do is so valuable. Yeah. And often when you speak with government politicians, everyone who has something to say, then they, they want figures. They want to see on a piece of paper or a computer. This is proof. Here you can see how important this is. So, yeah, I totally agree with you, Bev. It's so important. Um, and perhaps we have to to teach them, teach all these grassroots venues. You do like this. And then, yeah. I, I agree with you. Mm. I, I think another really interesting factor that I wasn't aware of prior to kind of like working in Sweden was the fact that you pay the first chunk of your income tax within the region as well, don't you? So like there is this income tax revenue going directly to the region if you are resident in the region. Now, if that's not the most obvious example for a talent retention and talent attraction economic regional development policy i've never heard of one before because when you look at had beyond all Vegas, yeah still been paying his taxes in vestavik then <laughs> kalmalan would not have been doing too badly yeah so it's it's those those arguments as well which kind of show the importance of like what you're doing with small and live mm. to say there's an economic benefit to talent attraction and talent retention mm. but then there's also the cultural benefits of talent you know, of maintaining those venues as well it's like yeah scornia trucks are based in oscar shaman as well yeah they're a huge attractant of a workforce and that mm. workforce wants the entertainment that live music venues bring and the passion that comes with live music venues as well, isn't it? Yeah, but perhaps this year when we had when we had the pandemic and we haven't had any live music, we haven't had any concerts or anything. Um, there is people are longing for it, I, and uh, now here in Sweden, everyone is wait, waiting for May seventeenth because then the government will tell us if we can uh, do something this summer, if we can have concerts. And uh, I've been contacted by restaurant owners, by the local paper, by local politicians. And they say, will you do something this summer if you can have 500 people in the audience? Will you please? Because we need it. We need it on a local uh, level. It's so important. So. Uh, yeah, so maybe it will be easier for us, Bev, to prove the importance of live music after this year, because I think we will see economical uh, proof <laughs> that 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 it's more needed than ever. 
Yeah, I mean, Mark knows because we've talked about this, that there's, there's actually, the figures are already being produced in the UK to show that the demand is there. And um, we've actually yeah. got two, two sets of data that are very recently um, released. One is a survey by Live, which is the representative industry for the whole of live music. And um, the members of Live, which includes Music Venue Trust, got music fans across the country to answer a short survey. Over 25,000 people gave responses to it. So you know it's a really good data set. And from that, the demand to return to attending live gigs was absolutely overwhelming. I mean, if I just look at the stats here, basically 53% of fans are ready right now to return. And the earliest possible date that we have in the UK for the return of music is the 17th of May, but yeah. that's <laughs> still with social distancing. Hmm. If that goes well, they're talking about full return from the 21st of June and there are further audiences that say, okay, I'll come back now. And then another 25% say with some mitigation. So some people are kind of okay with social distancing, but of course, most people just want to get back to being in a crowded, sweaty room mm. with other music <laughs> fans and that joy because 91% of the people who responded said that music brings them joy, live music brings them joy. Yeah. And, you know, they, it was really... It was a really interesting survey because even 75% of respondents said they would be prepared to have some sort of certification of a test before attending an event or vaccination or whatever was required if it mm. meant they could go back to live music. Yeah. And that is not the same as the impression that you're being given in the media generally about what people think about having to be tested to go to things. But this is what the live music audience is prepared to do if they can get back and see live music. Yeah. And if ever there was a moment to bring this conversation to a close, it is that. It's a in fact there is data, there is proof of the importance of live music, of live music venues, of the passion for live music venues generally, but also the economic benefits of live music venues as well. So on that note, and that positive note, which is great, and that's a perfect way to be yeah. able to end the conversation, ladies, thank you. Thanks so much for taking part in this panel. <clears throat> we really do appreciate your time, your insight. Yeah, and I think we, we, we just share that passion that we can't wait to be back in venues. And yes, yeah, so we can be having this conversation in real life passionately rather than through Zoom screens that as well. Fun. So thank you so much for taking part in the panel with us. Yeah, it's been absolutely fascinating to listen to you and to talk to you and to hear your insights. And thanks so much. And I cannot wait to see you all in Kalmalan, yeah, like <laughs> in real life, sitting in a venue, standing in a venue, waiting for a band to come on and being able to have this conversation. So Bev Wittrick, Maria Stedal, thank you so much for taking part in the conversation today. And thank you to Lassie Johansson for taking part in the previous part of the conversation as well. So thank you very much, ladies, and I look forward to seeing you very soon. Likewise, thank you. Bye-bye.